Okay, so once again, page 749 in the Stone Arts Book Chumash, Parshas Naso, chapter 4, verse 21, begins. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Take a census of the sons of Gershon as well, according to their father's household, according to their families. It says as well because this is very much a continuation of the previous parsha, Parshas Bamidbar, which we did two weeks ago, because last Shabbos was Shavuos. And... It inclu- and um, it ended off with a counting and telling over what the job was to be for the family of Kahaz, which is one of the sons of Levi. Now we're moving on to the next son of Kahaz, which, I'm sorry, the next son of Levi, which is Gershon. And it says, take a census of them. In verse 23, from 30 years of age and up until 50 years of age, you shall count them, everyone who comes to join the legion, to perform work in the tent of meeting. In verse 24, this is the work of the Gershonite family to work and to carry. This is the carrying they would do in the desert, that their job to carry the parts of the tabernacle. And they shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle in the tent of meeting, its cover, and the tachash cover that is above it, that is over it from above, and the screen of the entrance of the tent of meeting, the lace hangings of the courtyard, and the screen of the entrance of the gate of the of their service and everything that is made for them, and they shall serve. According to the word of Aaron and his sons, you shall, shall be all the work of the sons of Gershon, of the Gershonites, meaning the Kohanim will be in charge, um, and the, 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 the Kohanim will direct them in their work. Their entire burden and their entire work, you shall appoint their entire burning, burden as their charge. This is the work of the sons of the Gershonites in the tent of meeting, and they're chargedly under the authority of Isamar, the son of Aaron the Kohen. So the family of Gershon was in charge of carrying the tapestries of the tabernacle. So that's the covers over the top and the tapestries that were used as dividing walls were carried by the family of Gershon. Then in verse 29, we have the family of Merari, who was the third son of, or at least the third, and as we're enumerating now, son of Aaron, I mean of Levi. The sons of Merari, according to their families, according to their father's household, shall you count them? from 30 years of age and up once again. And in verse 31, this is the charge of their burden for all their work in the tent of meeting, the planks, the tabernacles, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, the pillars of the courtyard all around and their sockets, their pegs and their ropes for all their utensils and for all their work. And you shall appoint them by name to the utensils they are to carry on their watch. That's a very interesting (laughs) verse in verse 32. It says that you shall appoint them by name to the utensils they are to carry on their watch. That means that it wasn't that the Cohen who was in charge just like divided up the work amongst families or just, you know, he was just in charge to make sure everything was taken care of, but let the Levium do it, pretty much arrange it on their own. That's not the case. Every person was given a job by name that you, you know, um, you, Ruvain, this is your job to carry to the, this is your job to carry. You carry this specific item and they weren't allowed to trade. They each had their item that they had to carry and there was no, there was no trading, there was no paying somebody to do the work. And this was really true for all the Levim and the jobs of all the Levim. And the Ramban, I think it's the Ramban. Yeah, the Ramban says, the reason why it's written here specifically by Marari is because they carry the really heavy things. They were carrying the beams, the building material of the Mishkan. And they one second again, and therefore you might think that they'd, um, that, or at least they'd be the most likely to trade, that if one of them was feeling tired, so they would um, maybe pay someone off mm-hmm. to carry their burden. So it's specified here that it's given specifically to them. Yes, Ken? Who is it that decided that they were going to pick up and move on that next morning? So it's, I think next week's Parsha, it says... Um, I think it's next week's Pasha that Al Hashem Yachnu Al Hashem Yisrael. That is by the by the by the based on the command of Hashem they would camp, and by the command of Hashem they would travel. So right. there was a the cloud some, of glory was over the tabernacle, and when it would start moving, then they would know they had to pack up and start going. In some places, they may have stayed a year and more. Yes, that so, there were times that they stayed a long time, and there are times that they stayed one day. They never. And when they, they never knew up, they when they were going to have to work the next day until right, they, exactly. the word came down. Okay. And they, they and just even at, when they were setting up, unpacking, they never knew what tomorrow would bring. Right. And that's a part of why in 
the book of, I think it's the book of Yermia, right, right at the beginning of Jeremiah, it says, so says Hashem, this is a very popular song amongst the yeshiva crowd, that so says Hashem, Matzachin Bamidbar, that you've, I'm sorry, Zacharti Lachasin Oreich, I remember the kindness of your youth, Avas Kulusayich, the love of the time of the, of the marriage, Lachtich Acharad Bamidbar, Be'ezbelezua, that you followed me into the desert in a place that wasn't planted, that Hashem saying that the fact that we followed Hashem in the desert was considered almost a kindness to Hashem, because we were venturing to, into the unknown, and once again, we were following Hashem. It was just a matter of whenever it was, we got a signal, it's time to move, we would move, and that uncertainty made it very difficult. Right. Okay, um, so to continue on. Oh, um, I think it's Rav Shimon Schwab makes a comment here. So I said the Ramban says the reason why it's specified by, um, by Merari, the family of Merari, that they would um, that the job was given by name and it couldn't be switched is because they had the heaviest burden. Rav Shimon Schwab comments that it's possible that the carrying of the building material, the supports really, the structure of the tabernacle is um, a symb symbolic for the um, supporters of the Torah. That it's not the Torah itself, that was really kahas, that was the ones who carried the ark, they carried the ark that car contained the Torah. They're carrying the shelter, they're carrying the walls and the, you know, the, the, um, the material of the building that, that's over the Torah that stands for the supporters of Torah and the people who support the Torah are people who really feel that calling. They're people who are, it's almost like they're called by name and they, they have this very strong call, they have a very strong call inside themselves to support the Torah. This would have continued up to the time that David brought the, you know, uh, tabernacle into Jerusalem. No, because um, once they got to Israel, once they got to the land of Canaan at the time, mm -hmm. so they set up shop pretty quickly in um, Gilgal, where they had a, they, they stayed there for a while, and then they had a semi-permanent structure in Shiloh. Right. And that stood for some 300 odd years, I believe. I could, it couldn't be 200. I always get confused there. Um, 218, 318. I'm always confused with that. But it was in Shiloh for hundreds of years. And it was, instead of having this temporary pull apart, put, to, put back together structure, they actually had stone walls. They still had the tapestry coverings, but it was stone walls. It was like a permanent structure just with the temporary roof. Okay. Okay, so now I keep, excuse me. I keep hearing a voice. I can't tell whether that's it's Ken Miller. Hearing. That's who? Ken Miller is the one who's asking the questions, Ellen. Oh, Ken Miller. Yeah, okay. it's been a while. I forgot yeah. what he's yeah, I know Okay, but, Ken, but Alan, I gotta move on. So we're we're gonna move on. Um so in verse thirty three, this is the work of the families of the sons of Merari, and I'm gonna just skip a little bit. Let's see, where are we? It gives a count of all of them. And in verse 46, it sums up the count of all the families. It says, all those counted were the Levite, of the Levites who Moshe and Aaron, this is on page 751, it's still chapter four, verse 46. All those counted of the Levites whom Moshe and Aaron and the leaders of Israel counted according to their families and according to their father's household from 30 years of age and up until 50 years of age, which is the age that, ages that they served. Everyone who comes to perform the work of the service, the work of the burden of the tent of the sanctuary, the countings were 8,580. He counted them at, at the word of Hashem through Moshe, every man over his work and over his burden, and his count was as Hashem had commanded Moshe. Okay, just, and just one comment here. In verse 47, it says, everyone who comes to perform the work of the service and the work of the burden. So what's the work of the service? Our sages say that that's referring to the singing, that they would, that the, the Levium, the Levites, where they would make music and they would sing during the, um, when they brought the offerings. And um, that's, the work of the burden is carrying the burden. The work of the service is the work that would support the service. And that's the singing and music that the Levium performed. I think the burden was also the heavy musical instruments that they had to carry. Yeah, um, it could be. I, I don't, you know, I couldn't tell you how heavy they were, but 
I would think the building material would be considered more of a burden. And I don't know, actually, I don't know if that specifically had to be carried by the Levium, by the Levites. I don't know what the status of those musical instruments were in reference to the holiness. I mean, the structure of the tabernacle and the vessels that were used to actually perform the service were holy. And they actually, they could only be carried by the Levium, by the Levites. The instruments that they used, I don't know if they had to be carried by the Levium or maybe anyone could carry them. I don't oh, they know. had to be when they were used in the service. Right, they were only performed by the Levium. Okay, now on page 751, um, per, per, um, on chapter five, verse one, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, command the children of Israel that they shall expel from the camp everyone with taras, that's everyone with a spiritual leprosy, everyone who has had a zav emission, that's a, we, we've seen this before, a man who has had an emission from his, um, emission from his genitals that is not caused by arousal, and everyone contaminated by a human corpse. So these people are sent out of the, there are actually different levels here. And it says in verse three, I'll get to that in a second, male and female alike you shall expel to the outside of the camp, you shall, shall you expel them, so that they should not contaminate their camps among which I dwell. The children of Israel did so, etc. So our sages say that there are actually three levels of camps that people had to be sent out of. When it came to um, the, um, the, the three levels were the tabernacle itself, there was the camp of the Levites around the tabernacle, and then there was the general camp of the Israelites. So the only one who had to be sent out of that third level, the general camp of the Israelites, was some, a, a Misora, somebody who had this saras, this spiritual leprosy. Anyone who had any impurity that came through an omission from their bodies, for example, the example it gives in the Torah is the Zav, the man who has this omission that's not caused by any, um, any arousal, or a woman who's impure through being a nidaf, through menstruation, or through um, emissions that come not through menstruation, they would be sent out of the second camp, which is the camp of the Levites. And um, anyone, any, any other impurity, anyone with any other impurity, for example, someone who came in contact with a dead body, or a or sheritz, or a, um, a dead rodent, so they would be sent out of, just out of that first camp, out of the... Um, out of the tabernacle. And once we had the base of Mikdash, once we had the temple, things were a little different. We didn't really have a camp of the Levites proper, but the, um, the equivalent of the tabernacle there, the first, the most innermost layer, was the base of Mikdash, was the temple up, up to and including the um, Ezra Sisrael, the courtyard of the Israelites, which was there, you had the courtyard of the Kohanim where they brought the offerings. And Inside that, they had, or I guess further out, further away from the holies and the holy of holies, they had the courtyard of the Israelites. Anything inside there was considered the first level of holiness, where anybody who's impure on any level would be sent out, couldn't go in. Outside that, from the, um, from the outside of the courtyard of the Israelites, inclusive of the entire Temple Mount, is the equivalent of the Levite camp, and once again, anybody who is impure for, from, through emissions from their body would be sent out of there. And a mitzara, a somebody who was impure through the spiritual leprosy affliction, would be sent out of the city. They would have to go in the outskirts of the city. So, um, but this raises a very big question that very few people talk about. I know Rabbi Slatis mentioned that he was bothered by this until he found it in the uh, Meshachachma, which is that we said that anybody impure through a um, emission from their body is sent out of the camp of the Levites. That would include, but um, the Levites would tend to have wives, and many of their wives at many times would be nidas. They would be impure through the menstruation, which is an impurity of emission from their body. So how did they live if their wives had to leave them for a week every month or so? That would be, you know, they just have to leave the house and go outside, you know, like just find a friend to stay by, an Israelite friend to stay by. So the Meshachachma says that, and with other questions as well, which, and that would be that a man would also have to leave after any impurity, if he emits any semen as well, he would have to leave for a day or so, which would be very problematic because family life would be impossible. So the, um, 
So the Meshach Chachma answer is that there were actually two layers in the camp of the Levites, that there was immediately surrounding the tabernacle, that's what we're referring to as the Levite camp. And that's where like Moshe and Aaron, and there was like almost an honor guard of Levites surrounding the tabernacle, making sure people didn't come too close. And outside that was the regular camp of the Levites where people actually lived their family life. And that was not, that's, that's considered the third light layer, the Israelite layer, not the Levite layer. And that's where they actually lived in families. Okay. So now moving on, on page 753, verse 5. This is um, chapter 5, verse 5. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel, any, a man or a woman who commits any of man's sins by committing treachery towards Hashem, that person shall become guilty. They shall confess the sin they have committed. He shall make restitution for his guilt and its principal amount and add its fifth head and give it to the one whom he is indebted. This is very vague what it's talking about. And our sages understand it, that it's talking about one who's robbed another person and robbed means that he rather than sneaking in and, bur and burglarizing the person's property, he a strong arm, he strong armed somebody into giving something of theirs. So, you know, he went up to them and stuck them up. And so where the person can see them rather than sneaking in and stealing. And that's important because the, pun the punishment is slightly different. Um, so this is a case where once again, someone strong arm robbed somebody and committed treachery towards Hashem. That's referring to that he swore falsely by the name of Hashem that if somebody was accused of, um, of robbing someone else in court, so the court would make the person swear an oath that he didn't commit it. So if the person had sworn this oath that he did not commit the robbery, and then he admits that he did, as it says, they, in verse seven, they shall confess the sin they committed. So if they confess the sin, so then he shall make restitution. He pays the principal plus one fifth surcharge so he pays the principal of what he owes plus one fifth. This is not the case by a burglar. A burglar would pay double what he stole. The strong, the strong arm robber pays the principal plus one fifth and add a fifth and give it to the one to whom he is indebted. So that's the law of somebody who stole and swore falsely about it. And now in verse eight, if the man has no kinsman to whom the debt can be returned, that means that if the person he stole from died and there's no, then there's no inheritors, and our sages, the Gemara says that this is only possible. Everybody, every Jew has somebody who inherits from them. Because if we, he doesn't have anyone in the next generation, doesn't have any children, we'd go back a generation. Does he have any brothers? And, just, and do, did his brothers have children? If not, we go to his father, his father's brothers, their descendants. And at some point, you're going to have some inheritors. The only case where you have a Jew who doesn't have anybody to inherit from them is a case of a, a convert who died without children, who didn't ha doesn't have a wife or children when they die. So in that case, their parents who come, um, once they convert, it's considered as if they have no relatives. And if they don't have a wife or children when they die, so they're dying without inheritance. So their property in that case is really, according to the Talmudic Tal laws, up for grabs. And this, this gives very interesting um, cases in the Gemara of, um, of acquiring without knowledge, because it could be that somebody's handling a convert's property and didn't know that they died, but they were handling it. And then they found out the guy died and the question's raised, is that considered that they acquired it just by handling it because they had it when it was considered ownerless. But usually the, the property of a convert who does not have any, um, and, and really anyone who doesn't have any inheritors, but it's only possible by a convert when he dies, so the property becomes own ownerless and it's up for grabs for anybody. But um, in this case where someone stole from a convert who doesn't have any relatives and that convert dies, so they have an a personal obligation to make up for that, to make restitution, but there's nobody to give, to give the restitution to. So the Torah says, um, the returned debt is for Hashem, for the Kohen, aside for the Ram of Atonement with which he he shall provide him for atonement. That aside from paying restitution, he has to bring an offering, an asham, a guilt offering. So besides for the guilt offering, he gives this, um, the money, the, um, this, the principal plus the surcharge of one-fifth to the Kohen. And in verse nine, and every portion from any of the holies that the children of Israel bring to the Kohen shall be his. A man's holy shall be his, and what a man gives to the Kohen shall be his. 
So what's this referring to? When it says that a um, any portion from the, any of the holies that the children of Israel bring to the Kohen shall be his, that means that in spite of the fact that in some ways many of the holy things belongs to um, belong to Kohen. And our, our sages really interpret this to be referring specifically to Bikurim, to the first fruits that he brings to the temple and um, afterwards it's given to the Kohen, the Kohanim eat it. But the point that it's making here, which is true about all the gifts to the Kohen that were obligated to give, the holy gifts to the Kohen, like Truma, like the 150th or 160th of the produce that we give to the Kohen, or um, Truma's Meiser, the one-tenth that the Levi gives of his Meiser, of his tithe to the Kohen, that all these things are, um, it belongs to the Kohen, and if somebody eats it, it's like they're stealing from the Kohen, but the owner has the right to decide which Kohen he gives it to. He, they, we call that Tova Sano. We call that that he has the rights of distribution. And he could give it to his friend, the Kohen. And if one Kohen comes along, he could tell that Kohen that in spite of the fact that this belongs to the Kohanim, I don't want to give it to you. I want to give it to him. And the owner is entitled to that. That a man's holies that goes to the Kohen belongs, it's his. It's, it belongs to the owner in the sense that he could choose which Kohen he wants to give it to. Okay, and our, um, some commentaries interpret this in a little bit, one second, there's a little bit of an echo. I'm going to turn off the, um, I'm going to mute everybody and leave the option to unmute just to get rid of that echo. Second. Should be easier. Okay. So, um, yeah, so our sages interpret this in a little bit of an ethical sense or a midrashic sense that a man's holy shall be his is saying that what a person, the physical things that a person owns, they're not truly his. They could always go kaput. They could always be completely erased. And nobody could really feel secure that the physical um, objects of value that he has really are really his. And we all know that once we get to the grave, we, that doesn't follow us at all. It's not really ours. It, it, it's in our bank account, but it's not truly ours. What truly belongs to a person are Kadashav, are his holy things. That the tzedakah, the charity one gives, the good deeds that a person performs, those are always ours and it can't be taken away from us. Our money could be taken away from us. Our property could be taken away from us. But the good deeds that we've done, those are truly ours and they're permanently ours and can never be taken away from us. So now the next topic in the Parsha, on page 753 at the bottom, verse 11, is the Sota, the wayward wife. So I'll read part of it and then explain a little bit what it's talking about. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, verse 11, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, any man whose wife good shall go astray and commit treachery against him, and a man could have lain with her carnally, but it was hidden from the eyes of her husband and she became secluded and could have been defiled, but there was no witness against her and she had not been forced. And a spirit of jealousy had passed over him. He had warned his wife and she had become defiled. Or a spirit of jealousy had passed over him and he had warned his wife and she had not become defiled. And then it talks about the man shall bring his wife to the Kohen and it gives, gives the procedure. So what's this talking about? This is talking about if a man suspected his wife of adulterous activity with another man. And he, he warns her in front of two witnesses do not seclude yourself, do not go into seclusion in a private place alone with that person specifically. And he warned her in front of witnesses. And he has two witnesses come forward that following that, after that warning, she had secluded herself with that man. So that's the case that it's talking about. And he doesn't know what happened there. It could be that she committed adultery that second time. It could be she did it. He doesn't know. So usually in the case of adultery, which is actually something that we learn from here, usually in the case of adultery, um, the, woman be, the, the woman becomes prohibited to her husband. A man is obligated to divorce his wife if she, be, if she commits an act of adultery. And she's also prohibited to the person that she committed the act with. In this case, he doesn't know if she did it or not. He knows that he warned her and he knows that there are witnesses that she secluded herself with that person in spite of the warning. That's all he knows. And it says there's no witness against her. Our sages interpret that to mean that if there would be one witness 
that she actually committed adultery. One proper witness, not one of the two involved, but one proper witness who actually witnessed the adulterous act, then she wouldn't go through this, the following procedure. They would just have to get divorced, and that's the end of it. And it's only um, this procedure that follows is only if there's, they have no knowledge. We don't even have one, one witness, one kosher witness of what took place. So what do they do? Um, so in verse 15, the man shall bring his wife to the Kohen and he shall bring her offering for her a tenth and eighth of barley flour. He shall not pour oil over it and shall not put frankincense upon it for it is a meal offering of jealousies a meal offering of remembrance, a reminder of iniquity, that we don't pour oil in it. Oil is a symbol of light and of, um, a symbol of light and of like beautifying something. And we don't do this with this offering. In verse 16, the coin shall bring her near and have her stand before Hashem. He has her stand opposite the opening of the, of the holies, opposite the entrance of the sanctuary. The Kohen shall take sacred water in an earthenware vessel, and the Kohen shall take from the earth that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it in the water. The Kohen shall have the woman stand before Hashem and uncover the woman's head, and upon her hands he shall put the meal offering of remembrance. It is a meal offering of jealousies, and in the hands of the Kohen shall be the bitter waters that cause a curse. And our sages say that a lot of what's written here are things that we, we try to get her to confess. We don't want to go through with this drinking of the water for a number of reasons. One of them being like we see is that we write down the, um, the section that deals with the water of the Sota, the, this test of the Sota, this test of the unfaithful wife, and which includes the name of Hashem, and we erase it in, into the water. We erase the ink off the paper into the water, and she drinks that. And usually erasing the name of Hashem is something that, that would be a sin. It would be something very disrespectful to erase the name of Hashem, but we do it in order to make peace between a man and his wife. So, um, but we want to avoid that as much as possible. We want to avoid that if we can. So we try to get her to confess first. And um, that's why the Kohen brings her near, has her stand before, the, the, before Hashem, that he brings her in opposite the place of the Holy of Holies to inspire her to repent. And he puts some dirt in the water and he has the, he uncovers the woman's head. He puts the meal offering on her hand so she has to hold it to just that the, the burden is unpleasant. She has to hold that offering for a while. And um, it says that the water is bitter and the Rambam and the Medris says as well, I, the Rambam definitely brings, and the Ramban brings this Rambam, that she, um, that they would actually put, it, put something bitter into the, to make, put something in the water to make it taste bad to make it taste bitter, once again, in order to inspire her, we want to make this as uncomfortable as possible so she'd confess rather than go through with the, with the, with the test, with the drinking. And, um, and um, the Rambam says that we'd actually exhort her with stories about how what she did, although it's a very big sin, committing adultery is a very big sin, assuming she committed the crime, is that we tell her about great people who have also fallen into the trap of illicit relationships. And the Rambam says we tell her about Yehuda and Tamar that are great, one of the, the, great, the great sons of Yaakov, the sons, the sons of Jacob, who is the scion of the king, who's the um, ancestor of the kings of the Jewish people. He thought that he, he, had, relation, he, he, thought he had relations with a, with, the, with a harlot who turned out to be his daughter-in-law, his daughter-in-law, and who he really maybe should have been anyway. But um, that's, what, that's what his, what, where his thinking went. And the Rambam, and things like this, where we tell her that the, these drives are very strong in a person, and these are something that we can't do, it's against the Torah law, but it's something that people have fallen into. So just confess and basically trying to get her to, while taking the crime seriously, but at the same time, recognizing that she's not alone and it's something that she could confess without feeling so much shame that she'd just rather go through with it and die than confess. So then it continues. Um, in verse 21, the Kohen shall adjure the woman with an oath. In verse 19, I'm sorry, the Kohen shall adjure her, that means to swear an oath, place an oath upon her and say to the woman, if a man has not lain with you and you have not strayed in defilement with someone other than your husband, 
then you shall be innocent of these bitter waters. But if you have strayed with someone other than your husband, and if you have become defiled, and a man other than your husband has lain with you, then the Kohen shall adjure the woman with an oath and a curse. The Kohen shall say to the woman, may Hashem render you as a curse and an oath amongst your people. That means that when people swear an oath, they'd say like, if I did the following, like may this, may what happened to her happen to me, may I be like her, that she'd be like the example of like the worst possible thing. Um, when Hashem causes your thigh to collapse and your stomach to distend, these waters that cause a curse shall enter your innards and cause the stomach to distend and thigh to collapse and the woman shall respond, amen, amen. The Kohen shall inscribe these curses on a scroll and like I said, it contains the name of Hashem, which is very serious and erase it in the bitter waters that Hashem says, better my name should be erased and there should be, um, there should be lack of peace between man and his wife. And when, um, when he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter waters that cause curse and the bitter waters that cause curse shall come into her. And then it talks about the meal offering and the service for the meal offering. And in verse 27, it shall cause her to drink the water and it shall be that if she has become defiled and had committed treachery against her husband, the waters that cause curse shall come into her for bitterness and her stomach shall be distended and her thigh shall collapse and the woman shall become a curse amid her people. But if the woman had not become defiled and she is pure, then she shall be proven innocent and she shall bear a seed. So the um, Ramban points out that this is the only mitzvah in the Torah which is reliant on something miraculous. That and there, the Ramban says that there's no other mitzvah in the Torah that we actually invoke a miracle as part of the mitzvah. That we are commanded, do this, and um, a miracle will happen. That doesn't exist except in this case. I mean, there are times that Moshe was commanded to perform a miracle, but it's not a commandment for the generations that this is what you do for the following, that this is the mitzvah. And, there are, and something completely separate from nature, which this is. And the Ramban says that it goes to show the, how the holiness of the Jewish people is so important and the sacredness of the Jewish family life is so important. And the sacredness, especially of Jewish lineage is so important that if someone has children from, an, from, an, um, from such a union, so the child would be considered a mamzer, the child would be illegitimate and would introduce illegitimacy or especially unknown illegitimacy amongst the Jewish people. And that's so important that we rely on miracles for this. But the Rambam says, and the Ramban brings this as well, that um, our sages say that, that this test would only work for if the husband had never committed, had an, had an illicit relationship or an illicit act of immorality as well. But if the husband had such an act of immorality, then the test would not work. And that's, and that's for the reason given by the Ramban that this test is in order to preserve the holiness of our unions. And if the husband didn't preserve the holiness of his unions, so the test wouldn't work on his wife. This test isn't preserving the holiness of the union because there is a problem from his side as well. And then the test would not be effective. And our sages say that by the time of the second Beis Amikdash, the second temple, once there started to be a acts of immorality, regu regularly acts of immorality in public, so they stopped doing this test. They stopped doing the test of the waters of the Sota, because first of all, because they felt that it was irreparably damaged and this test would not, be, would not work enough to preserve our, the sacredness of the Jewish family. And and also because it was so because it became common for husbands to not keep their end of the bargain and to keep their relationships holy. So um, many times they would do the test and it wouldn't work. And the woman who knew that she committed the act of adultery would be able to say, "Look, the test didn't work," not knowing that her husband was also adulterous. And she would be able, she would think, she would think in her mind and she would tell all her friends that, you know, we have this mitzvah, we have this commandment and it doesn't work because I, because she knows she did commit the adultery and that caused a, a desecration of the name of Hashem. Therefore, they discontinued doing this test. Now, did the man that she committed adultery with, he also die or? Yes. So, um, where is it? The women shall become a curse amongst their people. Yes, so our sages say that while at the same time that the water that she would, her stomach would become distended, her thighs would collapse, that would happen to the adulterer as well. So 
So the man that she committed adultery would die as well at the same time. Okay, and once again, this could only be carried out if the person warned his wife in front of witnesses not to seclude herself with that person, and he has witnesses following that that she did in fact seclude herself, and at any time she could pull out of this and say and admit to the crime, in which case she would, um, he would be forced to, he would divorce her, she would lose her kasuba in that case. She would lose her, um, she would lose the amount that the husband would normally have to pay his wife for the divorce, but other than that, she could pull out without too much consequence of the marriage. So now, in, on page 759, chapter six, comes the section of the Nazar, the Nazarite. That Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, A man or a woman who shall disassociate himself by taking a Nazarite vow of abstinence for the sake of Hashem, from new or aged wine he shall abstain, and he shall not drink vinegar or wine or vinegar of aged wine. Anything in which grapes have been steeped, he shall not drink. He couldn't drink any kind of wine or any grape product. All the days of his abstinence, anything made from wine, grapes, even the skin or pips, he shall not eat. All the days of the Nazarite, that's the pips are the seeds. All the days of the Nazarite vow, a razor shall not pass over his head. He can't cut his hair. Until the completion of the days, he will be a Nazarite for the sake of Hashem. Holy shall be he. Holy he shall be. The growth of hair on his head shall grow. All the days of his abstinence for the sake of Hashem, he shall not come near a dead person. To his father, to his mother, to his brother or sister, he shall not contaminate himself to them. Upon their death, for the crown of Hashem is upon his head. All the days of his abstinence, he is holy to Hashem. And it's very interesting here. There's very, very much a dichotomy here by the Nazarite that we see over and over the Torah calls this person holy. This is someone who takes a vow that he will not, um, a Nazarite vow, which includes he will not um, drink any grape, any wine, or eat any grape products. He will not cut his hair and will not come in contact with the, dead, with the dead. And the Torah calls him holy for that reason. He's disassociating himself from the pleasures of this world. But at the same time, we'll see later that he brings a sin offering when he concludes. And our sages say that the reason for the sin offering is because of disassociating himself from the pleasures of this world. That the pleasures of this world were given, put there by Hashem for us to enjoy. And by disassociating with, with himself from those pleasures, he's committing a sin. So it's a very interesting dichotomy that he's holy, but at the same time, he's committing a sin. And the Ramban says, and many of the commentaries say, it all depends on the circumstances that the person um, accepted this vow. And um, the Gemara says that the reason why immediately after the section of the Sota of the unfaithful wife comes the section of the Nazarite, is, be, is because one who sees a sota, one who sees the unfaithful wife, wife at the time of her disgrace, should take the net, it's appropriate for them to take this Nazarite vow because they see the consequence of acting with a, um, acting, the, the expression uses with lightheadedness, meaning without taking things with a proper seriousness. And therefore they should ensure they don't get, they don't drink, they don't get drunk because drinking brings to these kind of acts that drinking brings to um, taking things less seriously and perhaps um, immoral acts. And someone grow, you know, getting a haircut, taking too much pride in their physical appearance also brings to these kind of acts. So they should, um, they, it would be appropriate for such a person to take these vows. But the Talmud Yerushalmi indicates that in other cases, when it takes this vow is considered in some ways a sinner. Once again, because the Torah prohibits many things upon us. We have many prohibitions in the Torah. We, we don't need to add any more. And in this case, when, the, when a person takes an oath, the thing that the oath actually makes something prohibited to him. And we don't need more prohibitions. We have enough. And um, the way some commentaries explain this is that when, when we have a prohibition, the Yitzhahar, the evil inclination, pushes us in that direction. It pushes us to... Um, to violate the prohibitions. So if a person may, brings a new prohibition on himself, he just created a new Yetzirah, he created a new inclination for evil, an inclination towards that thing that he may not have had. So it may be more appropriate in most cases, rather than make an oath that he's not going to do the following, is just accept upon himself without an oath that I'm gonna, going to um, try to um, grow in this direction and the person could accept upon themselves not to drink wine without making a Nazarite vow. But by making a Nazarite vow, he's making it official that this thing is, 
prohibited by Torah law to him, in that case, he's creating a Yetzirah, he's creating an inclination and creating the, um, he's creating a new sin that he didn't have before, a new possibility of sin. And ultimately, what we try to do is avoid sin, not create new opportunities for it. But um, in some cases, in a case where it's appropriate, this person is considered holy because he's separating from this world, working on his spirituality instead of on the phys physicality. So now in page 761, verse 9, if a person should die near him with quick suddenness and contaminate his Nazarite head. So now we said that um, he can't come in contact with the dead. What happens if he does? What, even if it's accidental, what happens if he's in a house and someone dies? So now he came in contact with the dead. He's under the same roof. He's contaminated. It says contaminate his Nazarite head because there's a prohibition against cutting his hair. That hair is holy. Um, he shall shave his head on the day he becomes purified, meaning it's a seven-day process to become purified through the ashes of the red heifer or the red cow, which we'll see um, soon enough in a, the next month or so. Um, the process of becoming pur purified from contact with the dead was a seven-day process. So, um, and the, he shall shave his head on the day he becomes purified. On the seventh day, he shall shave it. On the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young doves. He brings an offering. The Kohen shall make one as a sin offering and one as an elevation offering. He shall provide him atonement for having sinned regarding the person to sh sanctify his head on that day. And once again, what's the sin that he committed? So there are um, some commentaries that say, say that the sin is that he, um, that once again, the sin that he committed, he didn't know, he didn't purposely become contaminated by the dead. Someone died suddenly, suddenly. There was nothing he could do about it. The sin was that he deprived himself of the pleasures of this world. And it turned out that it was for nothing. Because since he wasn't able to complete his Nazarite period, which is as long as he accepts upon himself, so retroactively, that time that he deprived himself of, of, the enjoy, of the pleasures of this world that Hashem gave us was in vain. And now he has to redo it completely. So that time becomes, um, for that deprivation, he has to bring this offering. Or else it must be, some say that it must be, if Hashem caused that he, someone died on him, it must be there was something lacking from his performance, either from his acceptance of the vows or from his performance of the vows. So he has to bring the sin offering. Okay, now in verse 13, this shall be the law of the Nazarite on the day of his abstinence is completed. He shall bring himself to the entrance of the tent of meeting. This is if he completes it successfully, the time that he accepted on himself to be a Nazarite. He shall bring his offering to Hashem, one unblemished sheep in its first year as an elevation offering, one unblemished ewe, that's a female sheep, in his first year as a sin offering, and one unblemished ram as a peace offering. So, um, so once again, he's bringing a sin offering, and this is if he completes it successfully. So why is he bringing the sin offering? So once again, either for having deprived himself of what, the gifts of Hashem, the pleasures, pleasures that Hashem gave us in this world. The Ramban says, though, that he's bringing the sin offering because he achieved a level of holiness through his oath. Through this oath and through this deprivation, and um, what's the word? I suppose it's a great word here. He, through his disassociation, that's it. Through his disassociation with the pleasures and the physical, his, the, his physical pleasures of this world, so he has to, um, he became elevated, he became holy. And now that he's going back to his regular way of life, so that itself is almost a sin, that he's leaving his level, a level of holiness he achieved and downgrading himself to lower level of holiness. And just for that, he has to bring a sin offering. And um, Rav Shimon Schwab points out, I think it's Rav Shimon Schwab, that he also brings in a peace offering. And in fact, this peace offering is different than other peace offerings. A regular peace offering, you could eat for two days. If there's a time limit, you can eat for two days. This one, you could only eat for one day, a night and one day. And the only other peace offering we find like that is the Korban Toda, is the Thanksgiving offering. And the Rambam Maimonides actually joins them together in one chapter as the laws of the Nazarite, peace offering and the Toda and the Thanksgiving offering. And Rosh Hashanah says that it's possible that this peace offering is, is in a way a Thanksgiving offering, a thanks to Hashem for the spiritual achievements that he had over this period, that the, the new spiritual level that he achieved through his disassociation.
Okay, and then it gives the, um, the process of him becoming pure. He brings these offerings, he shaves his head again. And um, after that, after this process, he may drink wine. So now on page 763, verse 22, we have the laws of the priestly blessing. It states, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, So shall you bless the children of Israel, saying to them, May Hashem bless you and safeguard you. May Hashem illuminate his countenance for you and be gracious to you. May Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. This is the classic Birkas Kohanim, the blessing that the Kohanim give us. On, um, here we usually have the Kohanim do it on Yantif, on holidays in Israel. And among some Sparta communities, they do it every time we read the Torah, or maybe in every day. They do, they do it every single day. Um, and uh, it concludes, let them place my hand upon the children of Israel, and I shall bless them. The Kleyaka points out on the introduction to their blessings, it says, so you shall bless the children of Israel, saying to them. It says, what's the saying to them adding to the, um, what's the saying to them adding to, like, the blessing? So shall you bless them, may God, may Hashem bless you and safeguard you. So the Kleyaka says that the say to them, he brings a statement of our sages, but that's the source that the that before as the Kohana give the blessing, they're led by the chazan, they're led by the um, by the leader um, who's leading the prayers, who's leading the services, and they repeat after him. The chazan says Yevarachacha, and the Kohana repeat Yevarachacha. May God bless you. Every phrase, and the Kleyaka understands that when the Kohen says this, and this is illustrated also by the end where it says, "Let them place my name upon the children of Israel, and I shall bless them." that when the Kohen is saying that, he's in fact blessing the Kohanim. That Vamata, um, so shall you bless them, and say to them, meaning that the leader, the Chazan, says to the Kohanim, may God bless you, and then the Kohanim say to the children of Israel, may God bless you. And Hashem, Yishmerecha, word by word, the Chazan says it, then the Kohanim say it, the Chazan blesses the Kohanim, and the Kohanim bless the congregation, and he compares it to a, the Kohanim are like a vessel, that a conduit for Hashem's blessing, that first they have to be filled, and then they, they could bless the, the, the rest of the congregation. So by the chazan giving them blessing, that fills the kohan with blessing, so they're more appropriate to bless the rest of the people. And this is illustrated also by a comparison some give, that um, there's a very big difference between the blessing of a poor person and the blessing of a rich person. A poor person, has different um, ideas of what, what blessing is. A poor person might think that if, I ha if, I, if I'm secure with, my food, with food for tomorrow, I'm very blessed. Whereas a rich person will laugh at that and would, his ideas of what a blessing is are very different. So first the Kohazim blesses the Kohanim, so they're blessed already, so their blessing to the children of Israel will be a be better blessing. Their ideas of blessing will be greater because they're blessed themselves. Okay, so now, um, and just a word about what the blessing actually is. To begin with, it says, may Hashem bless you and safeguard you. And our sages say, may Hashem bless you, quoted by Rashi, means with material um, blessing. And safeguard you means safeguard that material blessing. Because many people get um, material blessing, but it's the security could be very difficult. You find people win the lottery, they win millions of dollars, and then a few weeks later, they're robbed. Someone shoots them, and um, they're they're killed in the by someone trying to take the money away from this. And this has happened many times. So um, while the wealth is having the wealth is beautiful, the more important thing is the security that we could keep it, and we're protected. And um, the Kleyakar also says that there's a dichotomy to these blessings. That it's a phys these physical blessings also are spiritual blessings at the same time. So we're protected physically, we're also protected spiritually, that we're protected from sin, etc. And then it says, may Hashem, lift, um, may Hashem illuminate his countenance for you, be gracious to you. Illuminate his countenance means allow us to receive the presence of Hashem as is shown in creation, so we're able to um, feel and um, sense the presence of Hashem. And Hashem will be gracious to us, will give us grace, that will be um, either accepted by Hashem or, or just acceptance by other people. And may Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. The Ramban interprets lift his countenance to you means that he closely supervises 
the um, that Hashem close, closely supervises the Jewish people, and um, we're very close with the providence of Hashem. And Rabbi, yeah, uh, in six point two, yeah, it says that both men and women can take the Nazarite vow. That's correct. But everything that's written here is really directed towards the male and not the female. So what sort of restrictions and penalties were placed on a woman if she violated the vow? The same thing. It would be the same that her, I, I believe it would be the same. I know they, um, I haven't learned the section of um, the Gemara that deals with this, the Nazir. But um, for the most part, I've seen bits and pieces. But I believe it would be the same. There, it could be there are some they derive from the verses that some are specific for the men, but not that I'm aware of. There's a story they give about the Chassam Sofer that somebody sent in him a whole essay um, about debating whether a woman could become a Nazarite. And he responded that, like, you're forgetting an explicit verse of the Torah, a man or a woman can make the Nazarite vow. So you're right, definitely making it they could. And the laws that it gives would be the same about the purification process. My assumption would be it's the same. I couldn't tell you for sure. I haven't studied them, the laws. Okay, so um, an established piece for you, of course, being obvious. Okay, so now in um, page 765, chapter seven, it gives the offerings that the, um, the leaders of the, the tribal leaders brought at the inauguration of the tabernacle. And it begins in chapter 7, page 765, verse 1. It was on the day that Moshe finished erecting the tabernacle, they anointed it, sanctified it, and all its utensils, and the altar, all its utensils, yet anointed and sanctified them. The leaders of Israel, the heads of their father's household, brought offerings. They were the leaders of the tribes. There were those who stand at the count, counting, excuse me. They brought their offerings before Hashem, six covered wa wagons, 12 oxen, a wagon for each two leaders, and an ox for each, and they brought them before the tabernacle. Hashem said to Moshe, saying, take from them, they shall be to perform the work of the tent of meeting. You shall give them to the Levites, each man according to his work. So the Levites would have these oxen and wagons to help them bear the burdens. So no tesseracts. Um, that's for Matt. But um, um, they had oxen to and the wagons to help them carry the burdens, carry the tabernacle, except for those who were carrying the sacred vessels. Those had to be carried by hand. And um, then it enumerates what they brought, the offerings they brought, and it turned out they brought, um, they brought animals as offerings, and they brought some vessels that they donated to the tabernacle, and they, they're all identical. Each of the leaders of the tribe brought an identical offering, but the Torah lists each one individually detailed. He, on the first day, the leader of the tribe of, um, uh, was Nashan, son of another of the tribe of Yehuda, and enumerated everything he brought, how big it was, how much of it, how much. And then the second day, Nisan, son of Tzor, this is the, the leader of Yisachar, everything exactly the same. And it goes through the whole thing. Eighth day, 11th day, the 12th day, it goes through the same thing 12 times, just changing the names. And the commentaries ask, why couldn't they have just said, they each brought this, they each brought the same offering. This was the offering they, break, they brought. He brought first, second, third, fourth. And um, the Ramban brings, I think he brings this from Rashi, um, that first of all, it was to um, give honor to, the, to those who fear Hashem. These are the leaders of the, of the tribe. They're exceedingly righteous individuals. So in order to honor them, it gives each of them their own section. It gives each of them their time to shine. Or um, I think he quotes Rashi, is that it's because it, this wasn't an agreement between all of them. They didn't all come together and agree that this is what they're going to do. They each thought of it individually. And not only did they each think of it individually, they all had different intentions behind what they were bringing, that they all ended up bringing the same thing, the same weights, but the, what it meant to each of them was different. They were all different people. They all came from different places, different tribes, they had different personalities. And um, the meaning of the offerings were different. That to, to one person, the, the measurement one thing, to another person, the measurement one something else, but miraculously it all turned out, it, it all came, ended up exactly the same. And that's why it enumerates it differently because there were really different offerings. The objects that were brought were the same and the weights were the same, the sizes were the same, 
but the meaning behind it was different, and therefore each offering was very different. And that's how that's how the parsha ends with these offerings, and then the dedication of the altar. And it concludes on page 773, verse 89. When Moshe arrived at the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from atop the cover that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two Kruvim, and he spoke to them, and moving on to Parsha's Bahalosva, where it talks about what, that's next week's Parsha, what he spoke. And I just wanted to say a word about the Haftarah. The Haftarah is on page, let me find it, assuming I didn't check, but assuming it's the regular Haftarah for Nasa. It's on page 1181 in the Art School Stone Chumash. It's from Judges 13, 2. Um, and it's about the Shimshon. So um, the Haftarah is about Shimshon, who was a Nazarite from birth, about the birth of Shimshon. An angel came to his mother, told her that she was going to have a child. He would be the savior of the Jewish people. And um, that he had to be a Nazarite from the womb. No wine, no... Uh, um, no wine or intoxicant, and can never shave his head, can never cut his hair. Very interestingly, she came, she told her husband what this angel told him, told her. And in verse 8 in the Haftarah, for those who have it, it says, Menoch prayed to Hashem and said, Please, my Lord, may the man of God whom you sent now come to us and teach us what shall we do to the lad who will be born. Which is very difficult because... He heard what was to be done with it. The angel told his wife already, and she told him. And it said, and then um, God heeded the call of Manoach. And um, in verse 12, it says, Manoach said, now your words shall come true. What shall be the conduct of the land and his behavior? And in verse 13, the angel of God said to Manoach, of everything that I spoke to the woman, let her beware. Of anything that comes from the grapevine, she shall not eat. Wine or intoxicants, she shall not drink. And anything prohibited to the Nazarite, she shall not eat. Everything that I commanded to her, she shall observe shall observe. Nothing new was given. So this whole thing is bizarre that he asked, he prayed to Hashem that Hashem should send an angel, what shall be done with the child, which they already knew. And angels came and told him the exact same thing that was told already. So um, Rabbi Shimon Schwab's explained, I think I've heard this also in the name of Rabbi Pan, that his question was not, what shall we do to the child that was already told he that he already heard his question was how do we educate the child to do this meaning that um this child was at was told to be a nazarite he was going to do things that are not uh, that are not obligatory on normal people so you're telling the child that he's going to that he can't drink wine and the father is going to be making kiddush on wine and telling the child this you can't do i'm doing it but you can't do you're gonna tell him that he can't cut his hair. All his friends are cutting their hair. His father is cutting their hair. His father is saying, you can't do that. So he was asking the angel, what should, how should we educate this child? How can we do that? How can we cause the child to grow up in such a manner? And the answer the angel gave, which is slightly different than Art School's translation, he asked once again, Manoch asked, what, what shall be the conduct of the lad and his behavior? So the, the angel said, of God said to Manoch, of everything that I spoke to the woman, let her beware she has to keep and then it continues of anything that comes from the grapevine she shall not eat could be bread you shall not eat and um, you can and any wine you cannot drink anything that's um, prohibited you cannot eat everything that I commanded her Tishmar you have to guard meaning that the angel was telling him that you're right you can't educate a child to um, act differently than you act yourself. You can't tell a child, do what I say, not what I do. So they're saying the only way to educate a child to be different like this is if you keep it yourself. So essentially the angel, Manal's question was, how do we educate a child to be different? The answer is don't, don't educate him to be different from you. You have to make yourself different so the child can emulate you. And essentially that was his answer. Okay, everybody have a great, where is this?